features a theme that represents the most recent issue as determined by experts in various professions. As we see today, that the new major in language, culture, and society offers an exploration of the relationship between language, social factors, and culture, multilingualism, <coughs> multilingualism language variation, and theories about how language is shaped by and in turn shapes our understanding about the world, social relations, identities, and power. Therefore, English Department Universitas PKRI Semarang in collaboration with Demsu wants to give contribution for that through this lecture. This lecture series intends to show updates and best practices in both works, language, culture, and society. Uh, to present the materials about those topics, we have already two prominent speakers here. The first one we have Dr. Nor Hidayat and from Ukris, and the second one we have Dr. Rina Rosbudeng from Dimsu. I would like to greet Mr. Hidayat first. Partner, good afternoon, partner. Are you already with us? Yes, we are here, teacher. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Rina Rose, welcome to the lecture. And Pak Nur, I haven't heard your voice. Yes, I'm I haven't here. heard your voice. But... Okay, thank you, Pak Nur. Ladies and gentlemen, each speaker will talk for about 45 minutes, continued by the discussion session for about 15 minutes. <coughs> if you, audience, want to ask some questions, you can type the questions down in the uh, in the chat box or by raising your hand in your uh, platform. Uh, okay, let me call upon our first speaker now. Our first speaker is Dr. Nor Hidayat. Allow me to read his profile. He is the head of the International Office Universitas PKRI Semarang. And for this lecture, Mr. Nor Hidayat will be delivering material about Indonesian past and present as represented by Yang Pots works. Pak Nur, your time is 45 minutes to deliver your material. Now time is yours. Thank you, Pak Nur. Thank you, Bu Faiza, uh, for the time given to me to have my, uh, my presentation. And thank you again uh, that the organizing committee uh, placed me to be the first speaker. Uh, <clears throat> secondly, I would like to extend my uh, respect to the second speaker, Dr. Rina Rose, uh, and probably some other uh, fellow lecturers from BIMSU and the organizing committee, as well as the, uh, my, my fellow lecturers from English Department of Greece and uh, students from Dinsu as well as students from Unitas Begiri Semarang, from the English Education Department of Unitas Begiri Semarang. <clears throat> okay, uh, I'm afraid that uh, my presentation might uh, take uh, longer than uh, I'm supposed to speak. So please uh, remind me if, uh, uh, I speak longer than uh, the time provided by by the speaker uh, by the uh, the organizing committee in this case the moderator. Uh, my presentation is entitled <clears throat> Indonesian Past and Present as uh, represented by the Indonesian uh, young the Indonesian young sorry. Uh, uh, Hello? Hello, Patnor? Yeah, it seems we have a trouble here. We have to wait for several minutes for Patnor to join us back. Okay, Patnor?
Okay, partner, can you hear my voice? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Bu Faiza. Uh, there is a technical problem that uh, I could not uh, see the audience here. <laughs> and okay, let me go on my uh, explanations. So uh, I I do not take the uh, materials of uh, let's say English literature to my presentations because in this case uh, I would like to uh, bridge I would like to bridge uh, the understanding of Indonesian literature to uh, Philippines uh, readers to Philippine students I think that would be uh, very interesting uh, for us for Indonesian students and uh, Dimsu students. Uh, to get to know each other in terms of uh, understanding uh, each of our literary works, literary works. Very, very sorry for another uh, technical problems. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think uh, each of uh, Indonesian students and Philippine students not, needs to understand each of our uh, literary work. So it is expected that there will be uh, a more understanding, a better understanding between Indonesian students and uh, Philippine students of uh, each of our uh, literary works or <coughs> works of literature that uh, we can learn it from uh, our uh, each of our liter uh, each of our uh, literary works. So uh, this is our beginning, and then hopefully uh, in another a similar uh, program, uh, a lectures from Dimsu. Uh, we'll be. Uh, we'll also have uh, another occasion to present uh, uh, Philippine literature to our students here, to Indonesian readers, to Indonesian students, and to Indonesian uh, listeners. So uh, I may say that this is uh, our beginning, right? Uh, we know as uh, we belong to Asian countries, the countries in Southeast. Asia, we uh, share many things in common. I believe we have some uh, commonalities uh, in terms of the history, in terms of culture, in terms of, let's say, uh, uh, political affairs and also the country development, uh, in which we can learn from uh, work of literature. As we know that uh, literature, the work of literature is the expressions of uh, people's life yeah, by which uh, language is its medium. So by uh, uh, getting uh, to know each of our literary works, we might uh, realize that uh, we share uh, similar experience, we share uh, similar uh, problems, that uh, mutual understanding could then uh, be achieved yeah, by us, the Indonesians, and also the Philippines. Oh, okay. Uh, let me go on my <clears throat> explanations. As uh, my uh, presentation uh, uh, suggests, uh, my, pr uh, my presentation would uh, uh, would present to you uh, a poems which is uh, written from the 90s and uh, to the year of 2020s. So it ranges around uh, the, uh, the latest uh, 30 times. And most of the writer that I uh, choose, uh, the poems uh, of whom I select, uh, mostly from uh, writers of the 30s. Yeah? Mostly they were born in 19...
how Indonesia uh, is pictured, how Indonesia is portrayed by uh, the young Indonesian poets. Yeah. What, uh, what can be learned from Indonesian experience during the last 30 years? What problems uh, Indonesian uh, uh, have in the last uh, 30 years? And uh, what can, uh, what uh, we can learn from those uh, 30 years experience, which is uh, portrayed by the young Indonesians, uh, poet or writers. Okay. Uh, Let's uh, take a look, uh, slide, uh, by slides, that uh, I'm going to explain to you, I'm going to present to you in a very uh, limited time. But hopefully that I could explain things what I have already prepared in uh, <clears throat> not more than for, uh, 45 minutes. Okay, as uh, my presentation suggests that the title is uh, Indonesian Past and Present as represented by Indonesian Young. Poets work, which range from the works of the 90s to uh, the 2020s. Next. I have uh, already selected uh, five uh, writers. Next, please. I have selected uh, five uh, writers. The first writers, yeah, the first writers, let me uh, show you the first writers. Sorry, sir, we can't hear your voice. Please unmute your microphone. The second. Okay. okay. The second writer is uh, Wahab, born in Pindrang, Makassar, on October 17, 1994. And this poem is entitled Before Old Age and a Mere Cat. And then we have then uh, uh, another. Uh, writer uh, 
and uh, Sulawesi is uh, an important uh, place in Indonesia in terms of their uh, poet writers and the uh, intellectual life, aside from Dafa. So as we know that uh, uh, most of Indonesian writers are mostly from Java, Indonesia, and some others are from Sulawesi. And then we have also another writer from Sulawesi uh, named Safri Arifuddin. Safri Arifuddin uh, Masri, born in West Sulawesi, uh, 1994. So the same age as the, the other, the previous writers. And his poem is entitled, uh, If Home Really Exists. And then we have the next writer, yeah, the next writer, the fourth writer. Uh, female writers, yeah. Uh, his name is, uh, her name is Ros Aruna with his poem entitled, Who Owns the Breast? So he might represent the voice of in Indonesian nowadays, women uh, yeah okay and the last uh poem the last point uh, is uh it uh, might be known as uh, the most uh, controversial writer he was uh, an activist he was a labor activist yeah uh, campaigning for the justice of the labor's life. He, read, uh, he led a rally. He recited his poem in the rally demonstration. And he was run after by the Indonesian military government. And it is said that uh, his whereabouts is not uh, unknown up to now. Uh, people are not sure whether he's still alive or uh, he's already died, uh, he's already dead. But mostly people assume that uh, he's already died mm. during the uh, crisis time in 19, uh, uh, the end of uh, the 90s, uh, a time prior to the resignations of uh, our second presidents, yeah, in which uh, Politic in Indonesia at that time is very chaotic. Okay, next. <clears throat> oh, from that, uh, no, uh, the previous, previous uh, uh, slides, please. Go back to the, the previous slides. Go back to the previous slides. So from those uh, five uh, poems, uh, seven poems altogether, there are uh, some topics that previous slides, there are some topics that we could uh, draw uh, uh, ringing from history especially the history of uh, Indonesian communism. Uh, it is in the year of 1960s, yeah? especially 1965, yeah? where uh, Indonesian politics is very uh, chaotic. Uh, it is said, uh, according to our formal history, the government history, that Indonesian Communist Party was uh, trying to take over the power from our first president, but they failed in their attempt to uh, take the power. And there are very, uh, and there are a lot of uh, uh, killings after the, uh, after the, that period of the history in which, according to some report that millions of Indonesians were killed 
during that uh, dark Indonesian episode. So uh, I believe that the uh, Philippines also has a similar experience uh, regarding uh, communist insurgent, the communist communism in general. And also we have another topics regarding uh, urban discontent yeah, or city life, city life absurdism and city life and their problems yeah, due to the rapid development in big countries like Jakarta and Manila and the problem resulted from the very rapid developments. So it deals with uh, urban life and their problems. And then also uh, the topics deals also with the marginalized people and also some international issues in which uh, our young poet is aware and they, are, they, they try to share their ideas uh, regarding this problem. And uh, we, we also have a, a poem talking about a poverty. Yeah, I believe that uh, uh, we have or we share some uh, similar problems regarding poverty. I have been going to uh, the capitals of Southeast Asian countries like uh, uh, Manila and Bangkok, and then also uh, Ho Chi Minh and uh, Kuala Lumpur. And then, yeah, I think uh, we share similar problems regarding cities and the poverty. And uh, another uh, theme is regarding uh, author, uh, authoritarianism. Uh, I would like to uh, let you know that Indonesia experienced uh, 20, uh, 32 years under authoritarian uh, government in which uh, the government are uh, dominated by those from uh, milita military uh, background. And uh, authoritarianism, uh, militarianism uh, bring uh, uh, their typical problems regarding the state relationship and uh, uh, the people's relation, uh, uh, relationship, the state and the people, the state and uh, the citizen. And uh, another poem, as represented by uh, Indonesian young women with their new consciousness, a new uh, uh, awareness about uh, their body. Yeah. So the topic is relating to women and their bodies. Yeah. The young writers representing the young Indonesian government trying to voice how they perceive their bodies. Yeah in a response to how women in thousand years or probably in hundred years in, in uh, by generations women uh, seems not to possess their own bodies bodies is for uh, uh, some other uh, people's life uh, sake or importance okay, okay. Okay, uh, we are going to take a look, yeah, one by one, yeah, as we have already understood, yeah, we have uh, some uh, definitions of literature. I take uh, two, uh, which has been, let's say, a common uh, language regarding how literature is defined. So, uh, as we have already understood, uh, literature could be as an expression of life by which language is used as a medium. Or literature is expression of thought, a reflection of society, reflections of uh, uh, yeah, a particular society in a particular time, a particular age. It contains the thought, reflection, on, and observance of people in certain period of time, which reflects their uh, lifestyle and culture. As I, as I have already explained to you in the beginning, from this point, uh, we will try to understand how Indonesia during the last 30 years uh, is portrayed by uh, its 
young uh, writers, how they perceive history, how they uh, see Indonesian current problems, and then how uh, they uh, try to understand Indonesian past with their, their problems. Then how uh, Indonesian young generation, Indonesian young generation living today, see themselves and define themselves. Okay, uh, we'll. So we'll uh, take a look. Uh, the first poem uh, written by uh, the first writer uh, <clears throat> entitled Cassie's Tale. So uh, let me. Let me read uh, the poem and uh, and also the uh, the students. Uh, you can take a look at the poem, and I believe that as English is the second language for a Philippine student, uh, it might not be uh, very difficult for you to uh, understand this poem. Let me read the complete uh, lines of uh, the poem. It seems that some lines <laughs> are not put here. So uh, I think uh, I should uh, read uh, from my copy here. The call had turned harsh when the police found him lying on the embankment, his body dirty and uh, beneath, beneath the moon on the brink of down. People knew that there was a hole in his stomach which continued to cause blood. His eyes were closed, yet his chest still rose and fell. The people knew him as, as he was from there but they were hesitant to help him since they would heard he had a piece of paper which listed the names of those to be taken by the commis. Commis here is uh, communist. A list that he was never found nor seen by a single soul. And then the next uh, lines is, he is an important person he shouted, he shouldn't be there, said one person. But the commies have lost, uh, said another. Four days prior, soldier had come and picked him up from his home and his wife. He had been certain he was not deceased. The woman who showed up out of nowhere rushed to cover him chasing the people away like a furious mother a tiger. And the people uh, scurried off as it was common knowledge that her late father had once met the prophet Kanjeng Kidir. Since that day, Kasi always wears a toothless grin, and the people greet him with a sore face, bitter smile. His children can never become a public servant or soldiers or police and is always at the other edge of African Duri or Tahlilan, 
tahlilan open duri is it's like a gathering a gathering uh, where uh, people visit uh, their neighbors to celebrate uh, yes uh, for for a certain uh, celebration of uh, a particular uh, celebration for that way he always receive his blessing meal first and hurriedly says his prayer which are answered with abuse from those who haven't yet received their own food once commis always a commis okay uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, this poem uh, tells us the as i have uh, mentioned before the dark uh, period of maybe the darkest period of indonesian history in which uh, uh, thousand hundreds or it might be uh, millions of people were killed during the failed attempt of uh, communist party in indonesia of uh, following uh, the failed attempt <clears throat> uh, of uh, withdrawing or uh, uh, taking over the indonesian uh, government the military uh, disbanded the the party and millions of people associated with the communist party were then killed uh, without a trial yeah? according to a, a yellow paper in in the united states that uh, those who were dead during uh, the failed attempt of a communist party uh, amounts to uh, one to two millions yeah and uh and then uh, what happens to those people associated uh, with uh, communism is then uh, as it is, as it has been happening in indonesia then the family of the uh, uh, communist member indonesian communist member was then uh, stigma uh, stigmatized yeah. and uh, during our second uh, president administration those associated with uh, uh, communist party or communism indonesian communism are not allowed to be uh, government officials they are not uh, allowed to uh, to be police uh, to be a teacher uh, to be uh, government uh, officer and uh, also their uh, uh, their uh, business might not be uh, uh, might, might not uh, grow very well since the, they they also have uh, limited access for loans from the bank and uh, their children yeah has their children their uh, uh, their children and their, their offspring of offspring uh, uh, subject to uh, as I have told you, uh, stigmatization, and and that's what happened to a uh, uh, member of. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, that's what happened in Indonesia in in the sixties. Yeah, and this uh, this poem, the last uh, line of the poem. Is, is said here, saying here, once call me, uh, always uh, call me. Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, this is how uh, Indonesian young poet try to understand uh, Indonesian past history. Although we have also understood that um, history is written by those in power, but uh, in this poem, uh, a writer might wants to uh, yeah show to the readers that history could be also interpreted uh, history could be also written by those who are not in power uh, uh, history could be written by uh, the victim uh, history could be written by the uh, those who are not in power the history might uh, uh, might could be written by uh, might be written by the layman. History might be written by uh, yeah, the, the 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 common people like uh, fishermen or uh, farmers or uh, 
those who are not in power. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the first tale. And then uh, we are going to have the second poem uh, written by the second writer. So, uh, Uh, we have a second poem entitled Before an Old Age. Yeah? Well, uh, as uh, I have been uh, going to many uh, different capitals, especially in Southeast Asia, as I have uh, understood, uh, Jakarta, Manila, Bangkok, and then uh, Hanoi, and then uh, Kuala Lumpur, and the um, paradigm of development in our country, in Asian countries, yeah, is uh, probably similar. Yeah. Uh, so the problem shared by uh, peoples in those big cities, in the urban cities life, uh, are not too much different. Are not too much different and uh, problems regarding to the uh, development of uh, cities and big cities uh, is also expressed here uh, as we have the title of the poem here before old age let me uh, read the, uh, one line by one line yeah before speaking of loss, they remember again the curve of the smile left behind on the mirror surface. The slope of that smile akin to a pair of arms and, and, and circling the wind. So uh, uh, as people living in the big cities, as the poor people, as the uh, people without money as uh, the underprivileged people, we have been accustomed to, to losing many things in our life, losing hopes, losing opportunities, losing uh, some other things in our life. So losing things for, for us is, is, some, uh, is not something uh, uh, unfamiliar. We have been used to it. We have been accustomed to it. Before brewing coffee and grumbling about Monday morning, they contemplate the laborers' fate, their wallets, strangled dry, all while asking why does the rupiah always follow the sun's course. Uh, course. Before brewing coffee and grumbling about Monday morning, they could uh, contemplate the laborers' fate, their wallets strangled dry, all while asking, why does the rupiah follow the sun's course? Right. Uh, as the underprivileged living in big cities uh, in urban life, uh, we have been uh, accustomed to living without money. Yeah, living without money. Uh, difficulties living with uh, without money yeah. uh, has been our daily uh, yeah, daily breakfast our daily uh, uh, daily coffee right and then the next uh, before the dish mother cooks is done as dusk they witness the street transform into dining tables. Serving gridlock, the people scatter from their, uh, their workplace and their warehouses, returning home like birds and nest. Uh, this is the urban life. Uh, this is the city life. Yeah. So our breakfast, our lunch, or maybe our dinner is uh, things like uh, uh, traffic jam, right? A traffic jam, uh, rushing uh, hours to go to work, yeah. uh, rushing uh, to, get, to go back to work 
leaving our houses early in the morning and going back home uh, late at night. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this is a common thing uh, what people uh, uh, do in a big cities like, like, like Jakarta. Yeah. So they have to uh, struggle to get bus to, to get the, the, the public transportation to get on bus buses uh, to get on a, a train and uh, yeah we could see people yeah, scattering from their, their, their workplace and their warehouses yeah returning home like birds uh, to nest right before uh, uh, the night's light dies and the quiet invites them to be talk about loss. Finally, they hear Kyril roaring from the bookshelves. Kyril, Kyril Anwar is uh, Indonesian uh, most noted uh, uh, poet. Yeah? And he's known for his remarks saying that love is only a delaying defeat. Life is only uh, delaying defeat. Life is only delaying defeat. Life is, and then life is, yeah. So uh, we are talking about uh, in in the in the third poem we are talking about uh, urban discontent. So how people in the big cities uh, face in their daily life what their problems have in their daily life. So they have been accustomed to losing things, having accustomed to poverty, to uh, yeah, limited amounts of money in their wallet. And they have to get used to uh, traffic jams, yeah, rushing, uh, they have to rush themselves to get the public transportation to get home early and so on and so on. So uh, uh, this poem uh, tried to present to us the so-called, yeah, the absurdity, we may say, the absurdity of uh, people's life, in a big, especially in a, in a big cities. And then I, I cited here uh, uh, remarks or sentences uh, uh, cited by uh, cited from Seno Kumira Ajidharma. Uh, he's uh, one of Indonesian most reputable uh, uh, writer, uh, novelist, yeah? and he say in Indonesian language. And then uh, I, I will try then to uh, translate to translate it into Indonesia. And Father, he's... sorry for interrupting. You have five more minutes to finish ah, the material. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, really? I only have a five more minutes. Maybe I could okay. have five more minutes, right? So, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, uh, ten minutes. Uh, ten minutes. Uh, okay. Okay. It's okay. To to finish my uh, explanation. Yeah. Well, Seno Gumira Ajidharma says, "Alangkah mengerikannya menjadi tua dengan kenangan masa muda yang hanya berisi kemacetan jalan." Yeah. It is uh, something terrifying. As uh, we are know in the old age, our our memory is just only about uh, traffic jam. Yeah, uh, being afraid of uh, getting uh, to our office late. Tugas-tugas rutin yang tidak mengubah semangat. Yeah, doing a routineous job, which uh, uh, which actually uh, the job that we 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 do not really like. Yeah, we are not fond of. And dan kehidupan seperti a mesin and, and 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 a life which is like machine yang uh, hanya akan berakhir dengan uh, pensiun yang uh, uh, tidak seberapa and unfortunately our life would be then ended by uh, well it's a, a trivial number a trivial amount of money for our uh, pension. So uh, again, Seno Gumiraji Dharma uh, would like to explain to us the absurd, uh, absurdity of uh, people's life, especially in the big cities. Yeah, as we get old, uh, 
our memories is about the traffic jam. Our memories is about being afraid to get uh, to our offices late and uh, uh, routine job, yeah. And then also uh, uh, living, working like machine. But unfortunately, ended with yeah, small number, a small amount of <laughs> money for our pension, right? Okay, so uh, another, let's say, might be seven minutes. Uh, we'll have uh, another uh, poem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another poem. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a similar, right? Uh, uh, the next poem, the next poem. Yeah, uh, considering the time uh, is running out, so uh, I, I, I'd rather. Uh, uh, present to you uh, the, the next point, and then uh, I'll bring uh, to you to another uh, perspective of the Indonesian young poet uh, regarding uh, what we call, let's say, uh, some international issues. Yeah? International issues. It deals with the politics. It deals with the poverty but uh, it deals uh, things like war, which could be uh, then uh, understood by uh, uh, different point, uh, 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 young poet especially, which might have a different perspective uh, from the other generation or older generations. In whom? really exist if home really exists then why do we cross the threshold of air and drift on the open ocean for asylum and citizenship well let me uh, uh relate this uh, stanza with the indonesian experience uh i, I think uh, uh, this happened after the failed coup of indonesian communist party uh during our first uh, uh, president government uh, a governance, uh, uh, the first president administration, our first president sent thousands of uh, Indonesian students, especially to Eastern European countries. But uh, after the resignations of uh, the first uh, president uh, and uh, Mr. Suharto, our second president, was in his uh, office, in his administrations, then uh, people associated with uh, the first president or people sent by the first president to uh, Eastern European countries for study, and then uh, are not uh, brave to go back to their countries. Uh, why? Because uh, those people then are associated uh, with uh, uh, communism, and they decided to, to be stateless in many different European countries, especially in Eastern European countries. And Indonesia experienced the so-called uh, uh, one generation brain drain. Indonesia should have been more developed, yeah? uh, uh, supposing that those thousands intellectual, those thousands uh, uh, university graduate with different expertise could go back to the country. But uh, due to a political uh, problems that they uh, could not go back to uh, the country for fear that they would be arrested by the Indonesian second uh, 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 administration. So we lost uh, one uh, generation brain drain. If home really exists, then why must we tend to build? Yeah? Then why must tents to be built next to the street? Clearings and uh, clearing the, and parks in the middle of soaring high buildings. We are talking about, uh, I think, uh, economic uh, discrepancy, economic gap. As we go to Jakarta, as we go to probably to Manila, we could see that, uh, yeah, uh, tents, uh, what you call card uh, or a, a, a house made of box and cards, uh, um, stay side by side with the skyscrapers and tall buildings. And this is where it comes in some big countries. So it's talking about uh, economic discrepancy. If home really exists, then why do missile hurl across the horizon, seeking nests and target, target where troops are constructing a 
barracks in our yards. So uh, we would uh, say that wherever we go, wherever we stay, wherever we are, we could not find the so-called homes. So the writer here is wondering uh, whether if the home really exists. Yeah. So uh, home, of course, is different from house yeah, in its concept. So home is related to peacefulness, related to uh, freedom, related to family, uh, uh, togetherness, and so on. And home seems nowadays uh, do not really exist as people uh, do not uh, really uh, could not really find the so-called uh, peace and peacefulness in nowadays people's life. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, this is uh, our four, uh, our six, uh, five, yeah, five poems. And then we have the last two poems. As I have told you, written by um, a very controversial poet uh, in Indonesia. And as, as I have already explained to you, Wiji Tuko uh, disappeared during, uh, yeah, prior, prior to the time where our second president resigned uh, from his presidency, yeah, learning from the Philippine uh, people's experience, which is called the people power. Indonesian people, uh, uh, Indonesian students go to the street demonstrating and uh, asking for uh, the second president uh, resignation. And Wichitupo is among those people who led a rally, especially uh, uh, for the laborers, for the workers, he read his poem, uh, he agitated people, he provoked people with, uh, with his poem, and then asking also uh, uh, the resonations of the Indonesian second uh, president. And then uh, uh, after that uh, incident, then the, the military tried to run after him. And he become uh, a fugitive. Yeah, he become fugitive and moving from one uh, city to the, uh, some other cities, uh, moving from one, one island to some other islands. But up to now, uh, history tells us that he's never found by his family. So people is wondering uh, his whereabouts, whether he's still alive is, or he is already uh, dead. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's what happens to uh, Wichitupo. The next, uh, the next slide, Kim. The next slide. Yeah. So uh, this is a, his his very powerful poem entitled "I'm Still Whole, and the Words Have Not Yet Perished." So this poem is read before the uh, the large number of people who are doing a rally, who are doing a demonstration asking for a better wage, a better payment for the, uh, the, the people from the uh, industrial, uh, uh, from the, those having the industry. Okay, let me read uh, the, his last two uh, uh, powerful uh, poem. I'm not a celebrity who makes headlines, but I'm always bad news for those who are in power, for those in power. My poems are not poetry, they are dark words. They sweat, they push one another to get out. You cannot kill them, you cannot kill my words. Although you strike my eyes, you cannot kill them, although you tear me from home. Although you stab me with loneliness, you just cannot kill them. I have paid the price with my time, my strength, and my wounds. The words ask for their juice. They always say to me, you are still alive. Yes, I'm still a whole. And the words have not yet perished. So uh, the government say that uh, Tukul's poem is a pamphlet. According to the government, according to the military, let's say, uh, uh, Tukul's poems is uh, like an agitation, provoking people to disobey the government. 
profan people to uh, take part in the let's say a civil disobedience uh, that's why as i have already mentioned to you that uh, the military was running after him yeah but according to some report then he was killed by the military and his body was uh, 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 thrown uh, into the sea yeah uh, yeah a, a certain books that i have read say that there is a report a witness saying that uh, they see uh, they see that uh, they saw that uh, Wichitukul was shot and then his body was then uh, sent to uh, the sea. And then uh, another picture in 19, uh, in, in the late of 90s, uh, as I have told you that it is the crisis time. So uh, what triggers uh, Indonesian, second, Indonesian second president into uh, his resignation is uh, due to the economic crisis, the economic, economic crisis. And uh, that's why that's what provoked uh, people to um, join in a big demonstration asking for his resignation. Okay, let me read. Hello, Panor. We can't hear you. <clears throat> Panor, are you still here with us? Uh, let me, yeah, sorry for a technical problem, another technical problem. Let me read my last uh, poem, yeah, uh, uh, written by Wichi Tukul. And then uh, this picture uh, tells you that I was very surprised when uh, I visited uh, Ipoh, uh, one of the city in uh, North Sulawesi. And in one uh, uh, of the uh, buildings wall there, I was very surprised to see uh, the painting of uh, Wichi Tukul with his famous uh, uh, words saying, Ini tanah airmu, di sini kita bukan turis. Yeah? This is our homeland. We are not tourists here. <laughs> this is uh, written by a uh, Malaysian uh, artist who probably... Uh, are very inspired by the who are uh, inspired by Wichi Tukul's works, Wichi Tukul's uh, poem. That uh, it is necessary for the Malaysian to uh, borrow uh, Wichi Tukul's uh, words for their expressions, let's say, probably addressed to the local government. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let me read uh, the last poem of. Uh, which it took well, entitled A Black Note. A black cat sneaked out and jumped off the roof. In the dark, three men hide holding metal bars. A black cat tiptoes, followed by shadows, and the end of the alley, the three grunt and strike. A moon swaddled in the clouds watches a festival of poverty as the cat's meat fills the man's belly, right? Well, uh, as we still remember that during the uh, economic crisis in the late of 80s, uh, people suffer very much economically. Uh, many families could not afford a decent food. They could not uh, afford to buy uh, 
uh, good food, you know, they could not afford to buy uh, milk you know, as uh, people might have babies. Here. And that's uh, one of the uh, problems that we have in Indonesia and have uh, in the late uh, 90s. Yeah. Uh, uh, economic problem uh, due to the economic uh, crisis happened to Indonesia and also some other Asian countries in, in the same period. And this is uh, a vividly uh, picture by Vijay Tukul that uh, people uh, turn to uh, consume uh, uh, food, yeah, to, uh, to, to, to turn to uh, yeah, things which are not food before then becoming their consumptions, like, like uh, ex explained in the poem, as cat is then killed and then eaten for yeah, yeah, <clears throat> another food consumption as uh, food uh, might be uh, uh, scarce or people are not uh, uh, cannot afford to buy uh, uh, a good food. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 that's all I think for my presentation, and I would like to apologize for some inconveniences due to uh, technical problems here with the uh, internet and the laptop in my, my office. And thank you very much for your uh, uh, kind attention. And time is uh, given back to the moderator, to uh, Faiza. Yeah. Thank you, Pak Noor. It was very, a very valuable insight for your presentations okay what i can highlight from this presentation is that a poem poem can describe the absurdity of people's life and poem also can inspire others to create poets works also okay uh, once again thank you Pak Noor. now before we moving on to the second speaker i would like to start the discussion session is there anyone who wants to ask some questions to Pak Noor? audience come on you can write your question down your question down or you can uh, click your raise hand button on your platform on your platform okay is there any question everyone Is there anyone who wants to ask some questions to partner? Okay, partner, it seems that we have we don't have any audience who want to ask some question. Uh, allow me to move on to the second speaker. Once again, thank you, partner, for presenting your material in this lecture series. Thank yeah, you. Okay, no, no, no. Uh, sorry, I cannot hear you clearly. Sorry, Pak Nur. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, I would like. Uh, I'm very sorry for all the inconveniences. Uh, I have here due to uh, technical problems and also probably the uh, connections. Yeah. It's okay, but no, it's okay. Uh, me too. I have some troubles in connection to here. Okay, once again, thank you, Panor. Thank you for presenting your valuable materials for this uh, lecture series. Thank you very much, Panor. Well, okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we move on to our second speaker. Uh, she is Dr. Rina Rospe Pudeng. Hello, Dr. Rina. Are you with us? Good afternoon, everyone. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon, Dr. Rina. Okay, thank you for joining. Okay, before you presenting your material, allow me to read your profile. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Rina Rusby Budeng. She is the head of the Bachelor of Arts in English Language Department of DIMSU, MLUC. And her research interest focuses mainly on interlanguage pragmatics and interface of culture through literature. Now, Dr. Rina will be delivering now. material entitled Language, Culture, and Society. Dr. Rina, now time is yours.
Okay, so good afternoon to our participants in Indonesia and also our participants in the Philippines. My topic is language, culture, and society. But before we are going to discuss the relationship between language and culture and the relationship between language and society, let's begin with the following scenario. So for example, you imagine yourself beside a six-year-old boy who belonged to an Aboriginal community. And then you're going to ask the six-year-old boy to point north. And then he would point precisely to the north without hesitation. And then you're going to ask a group of your teachers the same question. And then you are surprised that this group of educated adults would be pointing at several directions to the point that it would lead to a total state of confusion. Now you're going to ask yourself, why is it that this six-year-old boy can do it without hesitation and this group of experienced adults, educated adults, would do it with so much struggle. Now the answer is, or the answer has something to do with the relationship between language and culture and the relationship between language and society. Because this six-year-old boy was taught where is north or where to point north by his culture and also by his society. Now let's discuss first the relationship between language and culture. So these are the three main points that we're going to consider. So we're going to discuss the relationship between language and culture, and then the encoding of culture, and then the loss of language. Okay. So for years and years, there has been a lot of debate on the relationship between language and culture. So there were a lot of arguments and then claims. That is why it's very difficult for us to take a single position. So a lot of anthropologists and then linguists have been debating about the relationship between language and culture. So according to Alfred Kroeber, culture started when speech was available and formed at beginning. The enrichment of either one led to the other to develop further. And culture is the consequence of interaction and the act of communication is their cultural manifestation or assertion. So what Alfred Kroeber is trying to tell us is that the moment we started talking, the moment we started speaking, or the moment we started communicating or sharing, culture was born. Now the question is, where? What is you know more inferior? Is it language or culture, or which one is more influential? Is it language or culture? Now according to Alfred Kroeber. Language and culture go hand in hand. So language and culture also grow hand in hand. So it means to say that when a child acquires the language, he also acquires the culture of that linguistically rich environment he belongs. Okay, and the next, according to Edward Sapir, the real world is to a large extent unconsciously built up on the language habits of the group. No two languages are ever so similar that they represent the same social reality. The worlds in which different societies live are distinct, not merely the same with a different label attached. Okay, so it means to say that for example, in English speaking countries, okay, English speaking countries, we have England, Canada, and then Australia. So these are all English speaking countries. So they are closely related because they speak the same language. And also they their head of the state is Queen Elizabeth before, and now we have King Charles. So they are closely related. However, in Canada, England, and also Australia have different cultures. So you can just imagine, for example, if you're going to compare Canada and then Indonesia, or for example, Australia and uh, the Philippines. So completely different languages and completely different cultures. Because when you say different countries, it would also represent different cultures. So one way to better illustrate this is the concept of respect. For example, in Western countries, when we say respect, this is something that is earned or this is something that is gained. 
While respect in Eastern countries is something that is based on hierarchy, okay? So when you are in Western countries, they respect you only if you did something good to that person. For example, you are a general in the military, so you are not respected right away, but you are respected only if you did something good. Now, in Eastern countries, you are respected because you are a general. You do not have to do something good to those people. They just respect you because of your position. Okay. Next, according to David Crystal, language is a systematic conventional use of sound, signs, or written symbols in a human society for communication and self-expression. You know, David Crystal is one of my favorite linguists because my research field is pragmatics, and he gave the most cited definition of pragmatics in the body of literature. According to David Crystal, pragmatics is the study of language used by real people in, real, in, a re, in the real context. It means to say that the use of language depends on a lot of social situations or different contexts. Okay. So, for example, we're going to uh, analyze here some terms of address used to greet uh, John Jones, Mr. John Jones. Okay. So, Mr. John Jones is greeted by several people. So, one greeted him, hello, Mr. John Jones, and then the other person greeted him, hello, Mr. Jones, and then hello, John, hi, JJ, hi, Floppy. Now, why hi, JJ? Why hi, Floppy? So if you're going to analyze, for example, the situations, you know, between John Jones and then the people who greeted him, hi, JJ, or hi, Floppy, the relationship would go back to the beginning. Maybe they were friends when they were kids, okay? And then according to Ferdinand, Ferdinand de Saussure, if words stood for pre-existing concepts, they would all have exact equivalence in meaning from one language to the next, but not true. The concept of a sound image or symbol in different languages is different. Okay, so of all the written languages in the world, we also have different letters and also different symbols. So for example, in the English language, there are 26 letters, right? And in the Norwegian alphabet, there are three letters which are not included in the English alphabet. And then when you're going to take a look, a look at the Slovak alphabet, there are even accent marks for the letters that would indicate the sound of these letters. And if you're going to consider our Filipino alphabet, there are two letters which are not in the English language. One is Enye, which we borrowed from the Spanish, and then NG, which is uh, considered as a digra. Okay, so different languages for different countries, different letters, different symbols for different countries. And then another way to illustrate this is in the world, we have what we call alphabetic orthographies. So we have the Russian alphabet, which is also the same as the English alphabet. They are both um, alphabetic orthography. So when you say alphabetic orthographies, each symbol from the alphabet would represent an individual sound called phoneme. Okay? And then for the non-alphabetic orthography, such as Chinese and then Cherokee, each symbol from their alphabet would represent a larger sound unit called a syllable. And, you know, this phoneme or syllable would now affect the way we read or the way we use language. So this is now the differences of language in different cultures, okay? Next, uh, moving on, an individual language speaker's effectiveness in a foreign language is directly related to his or her understanding of the culture of that language. So it is possible to consider teaching culture through learners' own languages, which can be used in a specific way to interpret the other culture. So for example, when we learn language, sometimes we just learn the language and we do not 
learn anymore the culture of the English speakers or the English native speakers. Now, if we teach English to our students, it would have been better if we also teach the culture of these English native speakers. So for example, I also teach a foreign language, French, and whenever I teach friends, I would compare the culture of the French people to the culture of the Filipinos. For example, I tell my students, you know what, in the Philippines, we have a gender of nouns. But then when we say gender of nouns, only the nouns which are referring to people and the nouns which are referring to animals are gendered. But in French, all nouns are gendered. So for example, when we study food and beverages in French, I would tell them sandwich, hamburger, hot dog are masculine. Masculine nouns, salad, pizza, omelette are feminine nouns. In the Philippines, when it comes to food or beverages, they, their gender is neutral. They are not male or female or feminine or masculine. And in French also, when it comes to beverages, all beverages are um, masculine, okay? Like tomato juice, grape juice, lemonade, coffee, tea, chocolate. So they are all masculine. And then I would add that in the Philippines, we do not use tomato juice. Tomato juice is not popular. Tomato sauce, yes, we have in the Philippines, but not tomato juice. But tomato juice or anjudo tomat is very popular among French people. And then, for example, I also, when I discuss uh, to them about the weather, I would again compare the weather here in the Philippines or the seasons here in the Philippines to the seasons in France. Okay, so in France, just like Western countries, they have four seasons, spring, summer, autumn, or winter. While in the Philippines, we only have the dry or the wet season, or dry or the rainy season. That is why in French, they have very specific expressions to describe the weather when it's cold or when it's snowing. Like they say, il fait froid or il neige, something like that. So it would be better, for example, if when you are learning a second language or a foreign language, it's better to compare also the culture of that language to your own culture. Okay, next. For the encoding of culture, we're going to take a look at bilingualism and multilingualism. Okay, so most of us Filipinos, and I think also for Indonesians, are either bilingual or multilingual. So we can speak two, three, four, and some Filipinos can even speak five languages. However, with the choice of our language, with the choice of code, the speech patterns change, the communication pattern also change. Okay, so for example, for me personally, I can speak three languages. So I can speak Ilocano, which is my mother tongue or my native language. I can speak the Filipino language, which, our, which is our um, national language. And I can also speak English. Okay, and whenever I speak the Ilocano language, whenever I speak the Ilocano language, the funny side of me or the human side of me would come out. Because I speak Ilocano in my everyday conversations. I speak Ilocano at home. So I'm at home with my language. So when I use an Ilocano, the funny side of me, you know, the, my personality, which is very bubbly, I become alive when I, when I use Ilocano. Okay, now when I use the Filipino language or national language, you know, the Filipino language is a sweet language. It's, it's spoken in a, like a sing-song manner. So I also become sweet when I use the language. So my speech pattern will also change. Okay, now when I use the English language, I become very formal. I become direct to the point because I speak the English language with my students and with my colleagues in the academy. So I become very formal. And then another way to illustrate this one is related to the Warfian hypothesis. So when we say Warfian hypothesis, it says that language affects our thinking or language would affect the way we conceive the world. Okay. I've listened to one speaker from TED Talk, TED Talk, not TikTok, but TED Talk. 
according to her, she can also speak three languages. So she can speak German, she can speak Dutch, and then she can also speak French. So according to her, whenever she uses German, she becomes more in touch with her feelings. She becomes more grounded, something like that. And whenever she uses Dutch, she is more straightforward and she becomes very assertive. Okay. And then whenever she speaks French, it's as if she has a feeling that everything is different. Because like what I've told you, when you use the French language, all nouns are gendered. So it's either masculine or feminine. And all the adjectives also that would modify or that would go with these nouns are also either masculine or feminine. Okay, so for example, according to her, whenever she looks at the bridge, she would always associate this with something that is sturdy or strong because a bridge in French is masculine, so as opposed to feminine qualities. So whenever she would see things in French, she would see things differently because, you know, um, all things in French are gendered. Okay. Next, under encoding of culture, same language but different cultures, we have the case of English. So it says here, people who are multilingual have the same language like English, but different cultures and different representations in that language. Okay, so we are multilingual. So Filipinos and Indonesians are multilingual and we speak the same language, which is English. However, even if we speak the same language, we have different cultures. That is why we also have different representations of the English language. For example, in the Philippines, we have what we call Philippinisms, or these are transliterations of our native language into English. So they seem to be correct, but they are grammatically incorrect. So for example, instead of us saying, will you please switch off the light? We would say, will you please kill the light? Because this is a direct translation of patayin mo nga yung ilaw in Filipino. Okay, so it seems to be correct, you kill the light, but this is grammatically incorrect, okay? Or for example, whenever I teach my students speech acts, I give them a lot of situations. And then I would really notice that my students use Philippinisms instead of using the expressions of English native speakers. Okay, so for example, this is the situation. You are sitting next to someone who is playing his music too loudly, you say. So most of my Filipino students would say, will you please decrease the volume of your music? Or would you please decrease the vo volume of your sound? So we use the expression, decrease the volume. But if you were an American English speaker or a, a native English speaker, you would use the expression such as turn up or turn down. So an English native speaker would say, would you please turn down your music a little or will you please turn your music down a little? So you see the differences, okay? Next, under encoding of culture, an infant is exposed to its surroundings that it becomes individual in and of its cultural group. So this is largely unconscious and involuntary process. The newly born baby is exposed to a series of cultural elements all around. So like what I have told you, the moment a child acquires the language, he also acquires the culture of the rich linguistically environment Environment that he belongs. Okay. And the moment a call, the language is uh, paired, or the moment we interact, the culture is also born. Okay. Next, the understanding of a culture and its people can be enhanced by the knowledge of their language. So cultural understanding in a second language acquisition and learning. So when you learn English, you do not only learn grammar rules, vocabulary, pronunciation, spelling, conventions, but you also learn about the English culture, about the English society through language. So whenever we learn language, we also learn 
the society of the English speakers. So for example, in my literature class, when I teach them some literary works, for example, King Lear by William Shakespeare. So when we discuss King Lear, we can also help but discuss the the culture of Great Britain or England, okay? That, you know, in Great Britain, they have the monarchy, which dates back, you know, thousands of years ago. So they have kings and queens and queen consort, prince, princess, duke, duchess, and earl, something like that. So we learn about the monarchy, okay? And this is a part of the English culture, or, for example, we, we discuss the poem, Oh, Captain, My Captain. In discussing the poem, Oh, Captain, My Captain, you cannot really totally understand it if you do not know a little history about the United States. Because, Oh, Captain, My Captain is an elegy dedicated to Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln is the most celebrated president in the United States. So, you have to discuss what happened during the Civil War. You have to discuss about the Confederate Army, about the Union Army. So you're going to discuss the history of the United States. You discuss about slavery, okay? And then the time Abraham Lincoln became president. So not only the history, but also the culture of the American people. Okay, so while learning the English language, you learn the culture of the American people. Okay, next we have the loss of language. So it says here, with the loss of language, we lose our identity, steam, pride, shared history, shared knowledge, common binding factor, and cultural knowledge. So for example, we're going to take a look at the, the, the case of the spoken tribe of Indians. You know, before 1924, the spoken tribe were foreigners in the United States, or they were foreigners in America, even if they were born in the American soil. It was only in 1924 when they became American citizens. And when they became American citizens, the government forced them to enroll in um boarding schools and when they were in boarding schools they were forced to speak the english language and they were forbidden to speak their spokane language so they were forbidden they were even beaten they were even punished to speak spokane okay so because they cannot speak their own language of course they cannot practice also their own culture because you know, the, the Spokane tribe are full of spirituality. They have a lot of rituals. They have a lot of hymns. And in order to conduct all of these rituals and sing these hymns, they have to use their own language, but they were forbidden. So they were forbidden to uh, practice their own culture. And so now there are very few people who can speak the Spokane language. And they are afraid that when these people die, these elders die because most of them are already over 65 years old. So when they die, their culture also die. And then the next generation will also now lose their identity, their steam, their pride, their shared history, their shared knowledge their cultural knowledge. Because once a language is lost, the culture is also lost forever. Because, you know, there's even a saying that says, when a person dies, the whole library dies with him. Because you do not only know what knowledge that person knows, and when he dies, the, all of those knowledge, all of those history that he knows would also die with him. Okay, so for example, if a, a language dies, there are a lot of things that all also die. For example, the, the, the knowledge about medicine, which are encoded in the language, will also be lost. Or for example, the knowledge about constellation encoded in that language will also be lost. For example, we have the case of the ancient Egyptians, isn't it? They have a lot of 
language about constellation encoded in their language because when you talk about the pyramids in Egypt, you also associate it with the constellation. Okay. Now that's the relationship between language and culture. So we can say that when we talk about the relationship between language and culture, the relationship is interconnected, it is intertwined, it is interdependent, and it is symbiotic. Okay, now let's go to the relationship between language and society. So these are the main points we're going to consider. What is social linguistics? The assumption of relationship between society and language and four aspects of influences. Okay. Now the question we're going to ask is, how do language and social context cast influences on each other from the perspective of social linguistics? Okay, so before that, we're going to define social linguistics. So this is the social linguistic view of language. Social linguistics is the study of the connection between language and society and the way people use language in different social situations. Okay, so we use language in different situations. There are a lot of social situations. For example, we have the study of speech acts. You know, speech acts are and the use of language based on different contexts. So speech acts are very difficult to perform in a second language. For example, the speech act of complimenting. So let's have here the situation between Sarah and Sheng. So we have teacher Sarah telling Sheng, I couldn't agree with you more. And then Sheng was thinking, she couldn't agree with me. I thought she liked my idea. So little did Sheng know that when teacher Sarah told her, I couldn't agree with you more, she agrees with her idea. Okay. Another is the use of greeting alone is very complicated. There are a lot, uh, there are so many kinds of greetings and there are a lot of situations where you greet people, right? So for example, how do you greet your friends? What will you tell them? So this is usually in informal situations because those are your friends, right? So how do you greet your boss, for example? Or how do you greet a person who is older than you? Or how do you greet a member of the monarchy, for example, Queen Elizabeth? I always I use Queen Elizabeth as my example because she's my favorite monarch. Okay, or how do you greet someone for the first time? Okay, so for greetings, we have formal and informal greetings. And then we also have basic greetings. For example, how do you greet a stranger? Or how do you greet someone you do not know? Okay, or how do you greet someone whom you're meeting for the first time? So, Aside from greetings, for example, we also have apology or apologizing. So apologizing is also uh, used in different contexts. So for example, informal forms of apology or formal forms of apology, okay? Or for example, introducing someone, this is also very complicated in our society. For example, whom are you going to introduce first? Is it the female or the male? Or is it the older person or the younger person? Or is it the person with a higher uh, status or the person with a lower status? Something like that. So these speech acts, you know, this language which are used in different contexts are somewhat complicated to learn, especially we are not English native speakers, okay? Now, the role of language in society is huge. Language is a product of the human mind. We cannot conceptualize humans. We cannot conceptualize society without language. So we cannot understand ourselves. We cannot understand the society without language. Okay. Next, the role of society in language learning is vital. The society is the element that decides what we speak and the rules of use of language come from the society. So it's the society which tells us the rules in language. 
Okay. For example, for us Filipinos, whenever we talk to people, especially to people who are older than us, we always have to use the expressions po or opo. So when we say yes, we do not usually say oo, which means yes, but we say opo, which is more respectful. It's a sign of respect, especially if we are talking to people who are older than us. And in our utterances, in our interactions, we always insert the word po because this is a sign of respect. Okay, so because we use these expressions because this is what the Filipino society tells us. Okay. And then another one, the case of the Chinese people, for the Chinese, the term uncle has um, no general term. Okay. Uh, let's have this case, for example. So um, someone invites you to go out uh, for dinner. Okay. So that person will tell you, um, would you like to go out to dinner with me? Okay, so if you are an English speaker, you would say, oh, that sounds great, but my uncle is in town and he's inviting me to dinner tomorrow. Okay, something like that. But if you were a Chinese speaker, you are forced to talk about more about your family. Okay, you are forced to give more detail or information about your family because you're going to explain whether that uncle is your uncle by birth or your uncle by marriage, or you're going to identify or be more specific whether that uncle you're referring to is your uncle from your mother's side or your uncle from your father's side because there is no general term for uncle in Chinese. Unlike if you are an English speaker, when you just simply say, I have an uncle who's inviting me for dinner, they don't care anymore if that is your uncle by birth or your uncle by marriage or your uncle from your mother's side or your uncle from your father's side. Okay, But for the Chinese, they really have to be very specific. They are forced to give more details about the structure of their family. Okay. Next, there are assumptions of the relationship between language and society. The first assumption is language influences society. Next is society influences language. Next assumption is there is interaction as language influences society and society influences language. So they influence, influence each other. And then another assumption is there is no influence of either. Hence, language is just a tool for used by people and there is no social effect, okay? Now, in order for us to determine whether there's really a relationship between language and society, we're going to study their influences according to gender, culture, community, and economy. So we're going to discuss first gender differences. So in society, according to a study, for females, they are expected to be modest, moderate, no rude words. It means to say that women cannot swear, okay? But for the males, for their language, they are very straightforward because for the males, they talk more about facts or information. For the females, they talk more about feelings, about people, about human relationships, things like that. That is why they say that if you have a problem, you should approach a female rather than a male. Because for a female, they can discuss difficult subjects or difficult issues or emotional issues compared to men. Because for men, they, they avoid talking about uh, difficult issues or emotional issues because they have what they call stonewalling. Okay, and then when it comes to decision making for the females, before they arrive at a final decision, they want to talk about the process. Okay, so for example, they are going to say, um, let's do this, let's do that. What about if this will happen? We're, we're going to do it this way, we're going to do it that way. But for males, 
they are only interested in the final decision. Okay, so those are the differences between males and females according to some studies. Because in society, males and females have different roles, they have different rights, they also have different status. Of course, that is also now changing because we, are, we now live in the modern world when women are fighting for equality. Okay. Like, for example, before women are in the passive position and men are in the dominant position. So this has always been the case. But now we live in the 21st century. There are already you know, a lot of gender differences. Actually, especially in Western countries, especially in America, they now live in a woke progressive ideology. Like now, according to um, a lot of people in America, there are over 70 genders. So before we only have had two genders, right? We have the male and the female. And before, when we say gender, this is synonymous to sex. So when you say gender or sex, they are biologically determined. So we are either male or female, but now no. Gender is not anymore a synonym for sex. Gender now is a social construct. So gender now is based on feelings. So if you feel, for example, you are a man and you feel like a woman, then you are a woman. And the next week you feel like a man, then you are a man. The following week you feel like a woman, then you are now again a woman. Actually, when we discuss gender anything about gender this is a very sensitive issue many people have been canceled especially celebrities and in the united states some teachers were even suspended because of talking about gender okay so let's take a look at the headline from the washington post so it says okay, sorry for interrupting dr rina you have five more minutes to present okay. your paper Okay, so for example, they are talking here about pregnant people. Many commented that it should not be pregnant people, but should be pregnant women. Because, but then, you know, some people, again, reacted to this. They would claim that pregnant, it should be pregnant people because not all um, women, and not, not all people who get pregnant would identify themselves as women. And then we now have, again, the language is evolving. For example, we have here Justin Trudeau saying that mankind should be changed to people kind because, you know, people kind is more inclusive. It will include other genders, okay? So we now have these pronouns for the different genders, okay? Now for cultural differences, we have here, um, when we have similar cultures, we gain a sense of belonging or we can strengthen our personal identities and we can develop a scope of perception towards different situations. So for example, according to my husband who is a seafarer, whenever he goes abroad and then he meets a Filipino, for example, at the airport, and then he hears them talking in Filipino, he would go to them and talk to them because he has this sense of belonging or he can identify with them, okay? Now, how about for cultural differences, okay? So, for example, in the English language, there's no definite term for light blue or dark blue. Unlike in Russian, they have the term for light blue as Goloboy and then dark blue as Sini, okay? So, um, other colors, you know, are not encoded in the English language, so, for example, the case of the Namibian people in the Namibian plains, so they speak the Himba language. And a research was conducted among them, so they have showed them a color tile. Okay. And then after that, the researchers showed them a full range of colors, and then they were asked to identify the color tile that they just saw. And these people who speak the Himba language identified it just like the child's play. But then if you are an English speaker, you have a hard time identifying the color tile from the full array of colors because this color is not encoded in your language. Also in the Filipino language, this color is not encoded in our language. We, we also have, do not have terms for light blue or dark blue or light red or dark red. 
Okay. Next, when it comes to community differences, so we have your language and then the discourse community and then living and working environments and then the choice of language. So in the case of the Chinese people, they use local dialect at home or in their ordinary conversations. And then in school or in official and then academic purposes, they use Mandarin because we have what we call the diglossia. So when we say diglossia, we have... Uh, one language, but for this language, particular language, there are two varieties. So for example, in Switzerland, they speak German, but German has a low variety, which is Swiss German, and then it also has high variety or German. So for the low variety, Swiss German is being used at home or in everyday conversations, and German is used in official or academic functions or situations situations and then this is also the same with the arabic speaking countries so you they have the egyptian arabic and also the classical arabic and also in india they have hindi and sanskrit so the varieties which are under the low variety are used in at home or in ordinary conversations also we have bilingual diglossia we have here in the Philippines, so for example, in the Philippines, we use our native language at home, so that is different. And then we use English in um, academic and then official purposes. So completely different language. That's why we have bilingual diglossia. Okay. And then for economic differences, English is the most spoken language in the world, including native and non-native speakers. So English has become the world's common language. It is the default language in international business, tourism, technology, and much more. It means to say that if we can speak English, which is the most dominant language in the world, this will determine our economic success. So if we are fluent in English, we can work anywhere in the world and we can relate to anyone in the world because this is the most dominant language and we can be successful. We are in demand, for example, in the labor market. Uh, for example, I am a Filipino and then I work abroad. I have to learn the language of my destination country because this will determine my economic success. So when I go to Indonesia, I have to learn Bahasa Indonesia so that I can relate to the people in Indonesia. I can build you know, strong relationships with them and this will determine my economic success. Okay, so to sum up, According to Rita Mae Brown, language is the roadmap of a culture. It tells you where its people come from and where they are going. And according to John Maynard Smith, you couldn't have human society without language. So these are my references. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dinaros. Uh, this was so informative for us all here as the a participant of this lecture series. Okay, if I may conclude of what you have already presented is that it is about language and culture. Learning language means we have to learn about the society also. And then the role of society and language learning is vital. The rules of using language itself come from the society. Once the language is lost, it's, it means that the society lost its identity and self-esteem. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rinaros. Once again, thank, thank you, you very so much. much too. Yeah. Okay, audience, if you want to ask some questions, come on. You can write them down in the chat box. Okay, come on. If you have any question, you can write them down in the chat box. It seems that we don't have any <laughs> audience who want to ask some question here. Okay, uh, uh, before I close this lecture series, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to you both, Dr. Rina and Dr. Nur Hidayat for presenting your valuable materials. Once again, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, we have come to the end of this lecture series. I would like to thank everyone who made this lecture possible, and I thank the speakers for their presentation. 
I'm Faisawa on behalf of English Education Department of Universitas PKRI Semarang, wishing you a wonderful day. We will see you again in the next International Lecture Series next year. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, you are welcome.